So good afternoon, everyone. So we've had, um, going back in the past, we had Whitland versus Fraser, we've had Hawke versus Howard, now we've got Shorten versus Morrison. Not really the same type of names, are they? <laughs> a little bit, um, not the same aura about it, but um, that's what we've got. So welcome to uh, today's session. What we're going to talk about today are the way of tax changes. There's not really a lot of information to go by, it's just really just some policy notes in the LP website that we've got. And, Basically, there's no, there's no legislation, no one's been elected. So today's more like an awareness campaign in terms of what are, uh, what are the policies. Um, in your handouts that you do have, there's a summary there of 12 different policies the ALP will introduce with a comparison in relation to what the Liberals, I suppose, the Liberals offer as well. A lot of those Liberals aren't really more labor policy than liberal policy. So something that we'll go through is today. But we're going to focus on probably the main ones out of here, which hopefully will affect a lot of people in the group here. So let's sort of, um, we'll start um, pretty soon. But just to give a bit of, bit of odds in terms of the election, looking at sports bet today. The election's on the 18th of May, according to sports bet. Not sure whether that's accurate or not. <laughs> but um, Labor is $1.18 to win. Liberal, $4.50. The next one down to Greens at $201. Um, of course, as far as answer, Donald Trump is at $275 to win. So you count those two out, it's really Liberal versus Labor. It always has been, always will be. So let's start the conversation today. We'll look at the first topic, which is team changes to taxing of trusts. And these are discretionary trusts. So we'll just look at what the changes are. And there's an example which we'll go through, so I don't pay too much attention to these notes here. Um, the first one is that. The way that discretionary trusts work at the moment is that when you distribute to beneficiaries, the beneficiaries have access to the tax free threshold. So you've got different ranges of tax from 0% up to 47%. And you distribute something to someone who's on a $20,000 $20, but no other income, that's all tax free. What the Labor is proposing is that the tax rate would be a flat 30%. If your marginal tax rate is less than that, it's all pay tax at 30% by a tax free threshold. So that's going to be a major change to trust, which hasn't really received a lot of press. And we'll go through an example, a very basic example, as no one tells us if that will work. Um, so what happens with there's uh, yeah, the higher the beneficiary's marginal tax rate and the 30% and 30 tax rate. So what happens in the situation where you distribute to a beneficiary where their tax rate is at 47%? They'll still pay tax at 47%. The 30% is irrelevant. That's just the minimum tax rate that will be that will be charged. Uh, the commencement date, from what, I, from what I've read in the research I've done, they're proposing 1 July 19, which will be shortly after the election. So obviously it's going to go through the Parliament and, and the Senate and everything else. And a little bit later in the presentation, we'll sort of walk out to how that's all going to play out in terms of balance of probabilities. So that's in terms of a nutshell, in terms of what the changes to the trust are. Um, to look at the different <coughs> type of trust in terms of what's included and excluded, if you look at um, the left hand side, obviously discretionary trusts are all included. Um, hybrid trust, what a hybrid trust is, it's a cross between the unit trust and a discretionary trust. So that type of trust will have fixed elements where a distribution of income will flow through to various people on a fixed rate. And there's also the ability for the trustees of that trust to distribute at a discretionary rate. So that's what we call a hybrid trust, because it's a cross between a discretionary and hybrid. Um, <coughs> testamentary trust, is not excluded, I mean, is excluded from, from these rules. So a testamentary trust is what happens on death. So in your will, if you say that you're going to set up a testamentary trust, so you can quarantine, I suppose, the asset to that trust to certain beneficiaries, and then any distribution from that testamentary trust will not be affected by these rules. Um, farm trust, where there's uh, farms, farmland, farming business, those trusts will, won't be affected either. Uh, charitable trust and public unit trust, like the one you've got to through Westfield or whatever else. So, so the main attack is really on discretionary trust. And it, it is a major attack because we've got a situation, as we'll sh so show on the next slide, this is the current law, and on the left, left on your right hand side is the proposed law. So under the current law, there's three taxable income, $160,000. We've got three different beneficiaries. One whose only income is $20,000, one whose only income is $100,000, or one who's on a on $40,000, three different tax rates. So if you distribute to the person on $20,000, no tax, $100,000, $26,000 worth of tax, and $40,000, $4,600. Total tax payable, $30,000. To look at the proposed law, um, total tax bill will be $48,000. 
So you can see from that very basic example, because we're not using the tax rate thresholds of the fisheries, the tax is going to be significantly higher. So what that means for us is that we've got to start looking at, I suppose, strategies. A common, common thing is what happens with discretionary trust with peer point business is that the owners of the business do not pay themselves a salary, for example, or they receive these profit distributions, so that way they avoid parallel tax and lawyer cover and superannuation obligations. But it may be that those people now do receive some form of salary, whether it's $20,000 or $40,000, so that way then they can actually use those tax free thresholds now and pay a little bit less tax. So then that's going to be those type of strategies, if this law does go through, and it is a myth, um, that's what we'll, the type of things that we do have to look at. So it is um, a very major change. Um, back in 2000, when the government of the time, I think the Liberal Party wanted to tax trust as companies, and that didn't get through, and they had pretty much full control of parliaments back in those days. So just something to be aware of. You do have trusts, and then obviously something you have to put your mind to. If you know, once the election happens and Labor gets in and they do control the Senate, and then there's something that we really do need to strategize quite carefully. Um, considering the change will be from the next financial year if they do get through. Any questions on that, just as a aside? Huh? Okay, so why the attack on trust? So I'll just read this out, I won't spend too much time on it. Um, from the labour analysis, it shows that a disproportionate amount of discretionary trust distributions are allocated to people in a low marginal tax bracket with little or no work income. These are likely to be non-working members of the family, such as spouses and children in tertiary education. And that's something I think as accounting professionals, we sort of um, can relate to that quite strongly, where we do use a non-working spouse um, to, to stream income. That's the purpose of what a discretionary trust is. So, but, I mean, the question is, I mean, that's okay to attack trust and everything else, but why do we use trust anyway? I mean, it is a fundamental structure of a lot of Australian taxpayers who, are, who have businesses or who do, or who do invest. One is look, we look at succession planning. A trust does last for 80 years in terms of the discretionary element for it. Once 80 years does, does happen and that trust is vested, the trust doesn't disappear. It just turns into a fixed trust. A lot of people don't really realise that. And the beneficiaries of that trust are the specified beneficiaries. But what that means is that if the main people that trust is control it, they pass away, the assets are still retained in that trust. So it's like the succession plan where you don't have to transfer assets out to anybody else. If it's structured correctly, it's truly used for the benefit of the family and future generations. So that's one very significant advantage of the family trust. But I must say, as an aside, is that what I find generally, in terms of, I suppose, being in practice for 30 years, believe it or not, in public practice, um, a lot of clients, in my, in my experience, don't really understand in terms of succession planning of trust either. Because the trust is really controlled by, not the trustee, but what the person called the appointer of the trust. And it's all in the trustee document. And what that means is that the appointer has the right to hire and fire a trustee, and therefore they can appoint anybody they want as trustee. And therefore the appointed can control, actually appoint themselves, control the assets, and if there's some type of um, family split or family disagreement, distribute all the assets to themselves, potentially. So that's an area in which we we'll still need a lot of focus, I think. There might be a different type of seminar that we do hold about how to control it. Um, as to protection, everybody, I would imagine most people be aware that trust is used for asset protection, so that way you, you, you put a lot of assets for people, particularly people in high risk occupations and businesses, into, into trusts, so that way their personal assets are all protected. Um, flexibility or distribution of income, they can distribute to a range of beneficiaries, as the previous slide showed, they can distribute to beneficiaries like tax brackets and really split the tax liability among a lot of family members. And the last one there, access to capital gains tax concessions, such as, well, we'll get through in a, in a future slide, um, any assets that you hold in the trust and you sell those assets for a gain, provided you hold those assets for more than 12 months, uh, there's a 50% tax exemption on the capital gain. And if you're in business and you're a small business and you sell and you sell that business, and then any um, capital gains tax that you do make, there's a raft of concessions that you can use to potentially have the capital gains tax reduced to zero. So there's four valid reasons why we should have trusts. Um, what the Labor is proposing is we're just going to try and get a bit, bit more money out of those beneficiaries. And that's what they're trying to trying to do, just to balance out the budget a bit. Any questions so far? All good? Okay, so what to do now? Um, I think it would be, 
wouldn't be very prudent to put in strategies as of today because we don't know what the legislation is, we don't know if there's going to be any carve outs, um, we don't know the whole facts of the legislation, we've only got that much of a paragraph in that, in that in an ALP policy statement. So this is more an awareness, be aware of it. Um, once, 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 say once, if Labor does win the election, and then we might just, we'll have to consider strategies and just review the situation and see what the impact will be first and foremost, because it may be a hit on your cash flow. And then from there, what, what steps we can do to mitigate, mitigate the damage. Um, so yeah, if we're acting on it now, we we'll really warrant some, fairly, um, some consequences that may not be very beneficial. So the next one is changes to capital gains tax. So this is um, so what I mean by this is in relation to investments and how investments are taxed. Currently, as I just mentioned, if you own a property or shares, for example, and held those type of assets for more than 12 months. Part of the capital gain is tax free. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, what Labor is proposing is to actually reduce the exemption from 50% down to 25%. Um, this isn't really anything new. They did have to have this policy in the 2016 election. They've just um, yeah, regurgitated it again for, uh, for this election. So it applies to assets which are owned by individual taxpayers or trusts. So it'll be family trusts, um, unit trusts. Um, interesting, a super fund is a trust, but that's unaffected by this change. Um, the proposed start date is, is unknown, so that's something again we're sort of playing, but having read a lot of the Labor policy documents, they're proposing to put all of these changes in the first 12 months that they went off. So whether it be a 1 July 19 start date or 1 July 20 start date, so it's going to be happening fairly rapidly. Um, why the change? Um, the reason being is that Labor believes will just um, it will just increase housing affordability. I mean, the two major tax concessions that investors do use is the 50% discount and negative gearing, and they're attacking both of those. So they believe that, say, me as an investor has the advantage over someone who's looking to buy a home because I can use these tax concessions to actually make it more affordable for me to make bank repayments, for example. If I'm negative gear, I've got someone paying my rent, I'm getting a tax deduction on the negative gearing, which is the, which is the excess of rental expenses over rental income, and I'll get that back as a refund, put it back into the loan, reduce it a lot quicker than a homeowner. So I've got a lot more ammunition when I'm looking for a property to buy that property, because I've got these tax incentives. So what the government's trying to do is to really equalise everything and have a level playing field, and that's the reason for, for the change. But there are exemptions for it. So any investments that you own currently before the commencement date, whether it's 1 July 19 or 1 July 2020, they'll be grandfathered. What that means is that they'll be unaffected by the changes. So if you were to sell those assets, they'll still get the 50% discount. So that's great. There's only any new investments in shares or property. They're the ones that would be caught by that. Uh, investments by self-managed funds, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Then the effective capital gains tax rate, if you're in accumulation, that is, you're not in a, pen in a pension at all, is 10%. Provided you actually own that asset for more than 12 months and sell it for a gain, the capital gains tax rate is 10%. So that's unaffected. And the other one there is small business assets of, of business owners. So if you had a business, say it's in a trust or individual name, you sold your business and you've got goodwill attached to it or, or the factory that you work out of, um, that will still get the 50% general discount. You won't be part of these new, law, these new laws either. So they're the three exemptions that do exist, or that will exist. So an example about the capital gain, just look at the tax impact. So on the left is the current, on the right is the effect of the 25% discount. Um, so sale price one million dollars, purchase price five hundred grand. Net net effect on a very basic capital gains tax calculation is that there's a difference there of sixty close to sixty thousand dollars. So it is it is significant. And as we drill into the next in the next couple of slides, when we sort of add that to the negative gearing changes, we'll see the full impact of the labour policy really targeting housing and making housing more affordable. So what that means also, this is a very powerful slide, just take a moment to ponder that one. When we speak to clients, we're talking about capital gains, we always say the maximum tax rate that you're going to pay for any sale of an asset with a capital gain is 23.5%. 
Now look at the proposed changes, 35.25%. It's an absolutely massive jump. It's 12%. 12%. So what does, I mean, what does, that, uh, what does that really mean? Do you, before the commencement date, if Labor does to get in, do you go out and buy the property that you want? Notwithstanding that it's a volatile property market, downward spiral, there's a lot of negative press and everything else. But do you buy the and say, well, geez, that 50% discount's very attractive. That might be worth paying a bit more for a property today because I'll get the tax benefit later on. And that's a consideration as an investor that you would have to make. Um, the other one is in future, if you, after the commencement date, if you were to buy investments, what structure do you use? Do you stay with the trust structure? Do you, do you stay with an individual structure? If you go into a corporate structure, um, we've got a lot of clients, and I'm not sure whether this is too technical or not, that have a family trust, and they use a bucket company to distribute profit into to cap the tax rate at 30%. To, because they're, and that entitlement that's gone into that company is unpaid. Do the trust actually physically pay the money into that company and start investing through that company? Because the tax rate now is 30% in a company, but the effective tax rate on a capital gain is 35%. And they're the sort of considerations that you have to uh, think about with structuring. So it's going to mean a lot more thinking if Labor does get through in terms of what is the most appropriate structure and how we can actually get the best result from a tax point of view as well. So there's something to consider. So that one is a very scary slide when you look at it in isolation. It's a very powerful slide. And that shows the full impact of what Labor's trying to do. They're really trying to tax any decent capital gains that are made at a very high rate to really um, yeah, to get more money into the get more money into the budget. So, changing landscape, as I mentioned, review structure ownership before acquiring an asset. You purchase investments pre or post, uh, pre or post the change, and, with, and will a negative chair, uh, negative gearing changes affect your investment decision? What I mean by that, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, negative gearing changes. So I'll just spend a bit of time on these, there's five dot points there. The first one is that negative gearing will be limited to investments in new housing. So that's like the offer plan apartments or townhouses. The limiting, you can still negative gear like we do today. So if you go and see something that's um, on there, it's never been, it's been constructed, really constructed, and then they're the ones that will be totally unaffected by negative gearing. <coughs> uh, the reason why it's only limited to new housing is because they want investors to go down that path and look at investing in, in new housing and that housing construction market and all those type of things and leaving existing property alone. And that existing property would be more for the market of those unoccupied people who want to buy a home to live in. So they're really isolating new housing from existing housing and that's the whole thing and that's the whole that's the whole lead loss in terms of housing affordability. Uh, that's one of, their, you know, one of their policies and why they're doing it. Uh, losses in new investments in existing properties will be quarantined. Yeah, oh, sorry, losses in new investments in existing properties, so you make negative gearing, so your rental expenses are greater than your rental income, and that's on existing property that you do buy after the commencement date. Then those losses then can be offset against other forms of investment income, being, like say, dividends or interest or positive, positively geared rental properties. But the balance of it will be quarantined. So that, what that means is that that loss is deferred and carried forward, and that loss then can only be used when you sell that particular investment and apply, apply that against a capital gain to reduce that capital gain down, and you pay tax on what the difference is. We'll go through an example of how, of how that works. Uh, so what I mean by the third point, yeah, losses are not lost, so I don't think the losses are lost, like I said, they're not quarantined. So that's an important point to note. Um, doesn't apply to existing negative gear arrangements. So if you've got rental properties now or shares that you've borrowed against and, and they're all negative geared, they're totally unaffected by that. So very similar to that decision about do you buy a property pre or post to get the CGT discount. Do you buy a property now pre or post to take advantage of negative gearing? It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's a lot to go into this. Um, and grandfathering for negative gear for investments, yep, already mentioned that already. So all the investments that are currently negative geared are grandfathered and uh, are totally unaffected. So will there be a date uh, range, like going back in the last 12 months, or will it be from 1st of July? Um, when... There's no legislation, can't say. No, yeah, but when they, if and when they do bring it in, will it yes. be from that particular date? That's or will they backdate That's the question that I've had asked before, and yeah. I can't answer that one. Because they may say, if they announce it in budget, May 2020, that's the first 12 months of 
12 months of being in government, maybe even that day, or will I backdate it to 1 July 19? Mm. Um, don't know. And what if you buy a house at land value that's uh, basically a demolition job? How's that? <laughs> that's a very good question. Yeah. Again, that's another one that isn't, without the legislation, it's very hard to say you've only got top points we can go by. So mm. that is an example of being a scenario over which we'll have to work through legislation to see how that would work if and when that comes through. But um, I can't answer that one. It's just one of those early questions of which there's a lot of, a lot of questions, but not a lot of answers out there at the moment. Fair so effective negative quarantine negative area. So on the left is the current, on the right is proposed. Uh, the net rental loss on the right hand side is one that is quarantined. So you're paying tax on $100,000, which is your salary and wage income. So the net result here, so you can see by the, um, the line of the you lose your tax refund. In that case there. Very simple example, but again a very powerful slide. Um, very simple example, $5,700 is pretty much gone out of your pocket from a negative gear. But if you factor that into the sale of property and really combine the two all together, what we're doing is we're assuming a capital gain from the pre previous example, that $500,000 capital gain, and that's sort of down here in the second slide, on the second, second table. We're selling the property after 10 years of ownership, uh, the nuclear gearing and tax refund amount remain constant. So what I mean by that is that will be a regular constant refund of $5,700 um, per year for 10 years, and the nuclear gear is $15,000 constant for the next 10 years as well. And we're assuming a 47% tax rate. So under the current, we get the tax refund over 10 years, 57 grand. Um, the capital gains tax payable is $117,000. So the net amount of cash that you must pay to the Australian Taxation Office is $59,000. Under the proposed, there is no tax refund. So that's pretty, pretty clear. The quarantine losses are $150,000, which is $15,000 by 10 years. Uh, the capital gains tax payable is $123,000. So based on that same property, um, under the different tax laws, um, worse off by $70,000 round amounts. Uh, the way the capital gain is calculated, just for those people who are a bit more technically minded, on the right hand side, under the proposed capital gain before discount is 500. We apply the rental loss first before the discount. So we apply the rental loss of $150,000 first, multiply it by the discount, and we get to the capital gain. So the overall capital gain isn't that much different. It's actually the overall result over 10 years, and that's really driven by the loss of your tax refund. So it is. Again, it's way of policy, more taxes coming out from being here, yeah, more taxes from the investors' pockets. Yeah. Okay. Franking credits are another big ticket item. It's probably got the most press, and I could say, out of all the labour changes, this is the only one I've got phone calls on. <laughs> Everything else, probably lack of awareness, maybe, lack of press. But this one here has had a lot of press. It affects retirees, it affects the heart and soul of our nation. So, it's one that um, yeah, has got a lot of um, a lot of anger about it and, and everything else. So just a bit of a history about it. Pre-1987, there was no such thing as franking credits. So what that means is that there was double taxation. The company would make profits, they pay tax on those profits. And in those days, it was 49%, so it was a very high tax rate. And those profits are distributed to shareholders. And those shareholders will pay tax at their tax rate as well. But there's no concept of franking credits to reduce your tax down by using company tax already paid. So it was double taxation. In 1987, amidst a raft of changes that Keating in the court put through, which included fringe benefits tax, introduction of capital gains tax, it also introduced the, um, the franking credit system. Uh, <coughs> what that means is that you could use a franking credit, which is company tax paid, to reduce your tax down to, to zero. But any unused franking credit, as we as we do today, will not be issued as a refund. Either you, either you use it or you lose it. That's basically the philosophy back in 1987. And that lasted to 2000. Obviously a change in government, large budget surpluses. Um, Howard and, and Costello said, well, we'll give the money back to the taxpayers. And that's also the introduction of the mining boom as well. So at that time, that policy, that policy or that change in law cost taxpayers $550 million. And that was the cost of the taxpayer at that particular point in time. 19 years, fast forward 19 years until today, Shorten wants to go back to the future and go back to 1987. 
So I introduced that policy. The negative gearing, that was a key thing policy between 1985 to 1987 until, until they got lobbied by the pro uh, property industry and, that, um, and they abandoned negative gearing at that point in time. So that's what Chawton wants to do. His reason for it is that now, by paying Franklin Credits as refunds to taxpayers, it's costing the economy $8 billion, not $550 million. And he wants to use that money for infrastructure, hospitals, schools, defence, and all those sorts of things. Um, as a counter-argument, so I can see to be neutral here, is that um, the budget surplus is predicted in 2021 to be $22 billion, based on what I read in December 2018. So at the moment it's in deficit and it's reducing, but they're predicting a surplus and that's obviously, obviously based on employment, commodity prices, they're the two major ones, um, to get to that surplus. So, so from Jordan's point of view, he wants to use that money for something else. Um, and from Liberal's point of view, they're saying, well, we'll take something away that people's had for 19 years, which affects the retirees. The only people who will be exempted are those, are those who, are, who are receiving an age an age pension, or a, like a centre wing allowance, as of the 28th of March 2018. And that includes if one member in a South Manny Super Fund is receiving that pension as well, as of that date, they'll be excluded from these laws. So that's the only carve out that I can see as well. Um, so that's basically the timeline there. Yeah, sure. So those franking credits can be carried forward if you don't use them in the year? No. So you're saying it's lost in that it's year? It's lost. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, that's right, it's lost forever. A lot of our rebates in Australian taxation system, this is the only rebate that offers a tax refund. All the others, you either know, lose it or you lose it or lose it. But if we go back to the tax yep. imputation system that was introduced in 2000, yep. so um, so you know, that was the only thing that the Labor policy would be um, that if you don't, if you can't use your franking credit in that year, you'll lose it, you can't be carried forward. That's right. So that's backwards from 2000. Uh, from 2000, you could actually, that's the Cowan government, so you may introduce that, you can get cash refunds for your you franking credits. In 1987, you couldn't carry forward back in those days. You could either, you lose it. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. We're, going, we're really going back to 1987, where you can't use those franking credits anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what he's really, so Short is really introducing policies that Keating had two years ago, negative gearing, and also the franking credits. So there's no new policies, they're just going back to what they was back in back under the Keating, uh, under Keating and before. So a very powerful slide again in terms of what it means. Um, you can say the tax rate at 0% is your standard pension fund, self-managed fund, that's in pension. They will lose under the proposed all their franking credits. If you're in accumulation where the tax rate's at 15%, then you'll lose some of your franking credits. Um, and anything where your tax rate is over and above 30%, there's no change. There's no change at all in terms of Liberal or Labor, which really comes down to those low tax, those low tax rate players, um, being pensioners or those self-employed people, for example, not self-employed retirees, who just um, lift off their dividends as well, with maybe they'll enter into an age pension after the 28th of March as well. I know it's a little bit unfair, but um, they will lose a source of income. So because you're losing that source of income or that source of cash, um, what what do you do? What do you do? Do you just um, do you wear it? Do you change your spending habits, for example? Do you look at alternative forms of investment? And I'll ask somebody our financial advisor, Bureau West, at the back to save you as I said. Um, yeah, there's a whole range of um, thoughts that have to go through your head in terms of what do you do to replace that source of income. So what we're looking at is really some strategies. And the first one I will ask the, I will say to say a few words, and that's to review the investment strategy and asset allocation that you currently have. I might just quickly hand over to the sergeant. So with my clients actually, um, I know some of my clients are here, we only have about 15 to 20% allocated into Australian shares. So this impact is not gonna make a massive uh, downfall or anything to do with other pensions. So I always tell my clients, remember why we are investing um, for a goal, for retirement or funding the tuition fees or private school. This is the idea of investing. So we don't heavily rely on franking credit. I don't think any of my clients actually know 
they are getting any franking credit refunds even. Um, we only focus on the asset allocation. Where are we going to invest? That's our main goal. Um, if they're in a retirement, how are we going to fund the retirement? That's our goal. Um, so we still have the best companies in Australia. You know, doing this actually, people are going to go away from investing in Australia. But we still have really good companies, really good banks, financial institutes. So. Um, don't get discouraged because of the franking credit go somewhere else. You know, we still need to support other companies in Australia. So, um, yeah, we have to work together to see what impact gonna happen to a self-made super fund, then work with that. Are we gonna go and invest into international market or are we actually gonna go for infrastructure investments? Where can we actually pick up that extra income um, gonna lose from the franking credit? So that's what I'm encouraging my clients to do and I don't think anybody had any problems, <laughs> and they're happy with the income coming in. So um, we don't have massive impact gonna happen um, with the franking rate. So if you actually have a diversification and it actually constructed properly, um, you will have minimal impact on that. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Thanks, okay, so the next uh, strategy is um, most people who are in pension obviously go back to the previous slide, they're losing all the franking credits. So if their pension is commuted to accumulation, so in other words, you're going from a 0% tax environment to a 15% tax environment, and you've got enough franking credits within your super fund to pay to pay your tax, so that way there's no tax payable anyway, uh, that would be another strategy, because there are a number of benefits of doing that. The first one is, um, every year, that if you're on a pension, you have to make your minimum pension payments. It's all based on, on your age. You've got to take X percentage out of your total balance of the year before. So if you go to accumulation, um, you don't need as much of a pension stream. You take it out because you're required to buy law. Why not leave that money in super and use that to invest and really grow your wealth in that super fund a little bit more? That's one strategy to do. So that really preserves the wealth in there, um, leaves the cash flow in there as well and that means you have more money in super. So that's one strategy that you can do. So that's, uh, that's, that's one to keep money in super. The other one is based on a budget, <coughs> budget announcement in last budget with, um, with, with the volleyball party, that um, super funds can increase their members from four members to six. That law has gone through the House of Representatives and it's part of the Senate inquiry at the moment. But by increasing the amount of people in the super fund from four to six, it's bringing, it's bringing those ranking credits around to a lot more people. So which means you're getting better utilisation on those franking credits, and that could be of a benefit there as well. And also helps with succession planning of that super fund as well, because if you bring in other family members, and as family members unfortunately pass away, at least you don't have to wind up that fund, because once there's no more members in a super fund, the fund has to be wound up, it's not, it's not kept forever. So by having members in there, and then um, that fund can continue based on their own members' balances. So there's strategies around that as well, but that's something that is a potential strategy, um, but it's all based on obviously getting passed through through the Senate and being passed through and, and becoming more at, at some point in time. So they're the two, the two strategies that are sort of getting a bit of focus at the moment. So what I'll do now, unless there's any questions, or can be questions at the end, if you don't mind either way, I'll hand over to Nilea to talk about the superannuation changes. Thanks, Mark. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Um, there are so many changes was proposed for the Southern Super Fund and superannuation area per se. Um, but we are starting with some of the most prominent ones. <coughs> One of them is removal of franking credit refunds, which already Mark touched on. Um, as he explained, that people would be on the pension phase or in pension retirement phase would be affected significantly, and we have some strategies in place which can be used if this law is going to be, uh, if this, uh, of, you know, the changes from the law. The second one is the reintroduction of the 10% rule for making personal concession contributions. Um, this particular rule is affected uh, most of the, at the moment what happens is whether you are employee or you are, or you are self-employed, you can claim up to $25,000 worth of personal concession contributions. But uh, it will be affected after that rule. So I'll discuss in detail after we go to the next, next slides. The next one is reduction in non concession contributions from 100,000 to 75,000. Uh, that's the current non concession contributions cap, which is a yearly cap, which is 100,000. 
uh, what Labor is proposing to at its seventy five thousand uh, dollars. We will discuss in detail that one as well. Uh, reduction in the bring forward non concession contribution rule. So at the moment, if the person is less than sixty five years of age, what they can do is they can uh, they can put up to three hundred thousand at the moment into the super fund as a non -con non concession contribution, which is three times of the annual non concession gap, which is hundred thousand. So you can put 300,000 in the one place at the same time. Um, and uh, what Labor is proposing to reduce it to 225K as well. So that will be discussed. Uh, reduction to the high income and contribution threshold from 250,000 to 200. What it means is a person who is earning 250,000 a year uh, will end up paying more tax. Um, in the, in, the, in the labor proposed changes, and we will, that would the last one we will look into that. The other changes are that removal of newly introduced carry forward concession contributions gap. So from 1st of the July 2019 onwards, uh, which is not even implemented yet, but what Liberal has introduced that cap, which is uh, you can carry forward the non-use concession contributions cap. So if you haven't used anything, then you can use it in the next year, so that you are not losing out on those sort of caps. So what labor is proposing you to remove that as well. And then one of the last one is uh, ban LRBA borrowing arrangement in self financial super fund at all. So what they're saying is no LRBA is in place. So you cannot buy properties by uh, going through limited borrowing arrangement, which is by taking a loan. So those are the main changes uh, that are offered, but we'll see how many are going through them. Now we will go into detail by one by one. So. The first one, which is reintroduction of 10% rule to claim personal concession contributions. So what happens is, at the moment, if you're under 65, you can claim a reduction of personal concession contributions, regardless of your work situation. Um, so what happens is, you can claim 25,000, maximum 25,000, which is that's a cap of concession contributions cap. Every year, you can claim up to that limit. Uh, but going forward, that wouldn't be the case because what happens is what they're saying is that your total income plus your fringe benefit benefits and your super contributions, a total of all those sort of three, the 10% of that amount, if it's not from the employment activities, then you are not eligible to claim those uh, personal concession contributions. So what happens is uh, if a person is earning too much but having no wages, then he will lose out on these proposed changes. So those were introduced to help self-employed people, uh, but the, benef the, the benefit of that for the employer, employed people, is that they can have the benefit of that as well, which will be the case. For example, under the current law, if the employer makes a superannuation contributions of 9,500 on behalf of the employee, which means if an employee is earning $100,000, Employer would put nine and a half percent superannuation guarantee such uh, guarantees, which is nine thousand five hundred. Uh, but then the employee himself or herself put another fifteen thousand five hundred out of his pocket into the super fund and claim the deductions of that fifteen thousand five hundred against his or her other income. So that person would have this additional benefit of deductions of fifteen thousand five hundred, um, which wouldn't be the case if this changes would become a law. So that's the difference, which could be significant because if you see the deductions, point of view, then it would be significant. What would be the effect of these changes? The lesser amount will be contributed into the super fund, of course, because that person wouldn't be making the 15,500 now because he's not getting any benefit out of it. So lesser amount will be contributed into the super fund, which means the superannuation member balance wouldn't grow at that level. And then the second thing, most of the employees who are currently getting the benefit out of it by claiming the deductions may not be able to do that. So those are the effects of that kind of change. The next one is reduction in the non-concessional contributions and the bring forward <coughs> contributions. Why I join those two changes? Because they are kind of connected with each other. The first one is at the moment, so if the non-concessional contributions, which is you you don't, you don't have to pay any tax on that. So if you wouldn't have any paid or tax on that, that's your money out of your pocket if you put into the super fund, which is $100,000 at the moment, which you can make every year. Of course, uh, if you are under 65, you, can, you don't have to meet any work case, but if you are 
between 65 to 75, uh, you need to meet the work test. The work test is if you're working 40 hours in a consecutive 30 days. So if you're working at least in whole financial year. So if you're working only 40 hours in a, in a one month period, then you're meeting with the work test. And in that case, uh, that person can make non-concessional contributions. Um, and then on top of that, what are the current rules are saying that that 100,000 is yes, but if you have a lump sum, if you want to put in a super fund, up to 300,000, you can put in one financial year. Uh, and then it's, it's still, you're still allowed to do that, as long as you are under 65, because once you turn 65, you are not allowed to do that thing. But the, the, the benefit of that is, yes, you can put one lump sum into the super fund, and then you can start having the benefit of the concessional rates of the self financed super fund. The only consequences of that, the next two years, you cannot make any contributions because you have utilized the next two years non-concessional contributions cap into one year. So you have bring forward two years of cap in one year. Um, of course, those rules are affected by the uh, you know, total superannuation balance of 1.6. So if you have more than 1.6 million in your pension accounts in the self financed super funds or super funds, then you cannot make any of these contributions at the moment because that's the that's the very basic rules at the moment that are happening. That if you have more point, more than 1.6 million in your pension accounts, you cannot make non-concession contributions, and of course not bring forward the rule. But have to be now, what's a proposed law? The labor is proposing to have the non-concession contributions kept from 100,000 to 75,000, and so it will affect the bring forward rule, which is from 300,000 to 225,000, because that's directly connected. So that's how it happens. What would be the effect of that? Same. The lesser amounts will be contributed to the super fund, which will not help members to grow their. Because previously you can make 300,000 or 100,000 every year, which you cannot do it. You only put 225,000 or 75,000, which means it's kind of stopping you to put more money into your super fund. Reduction of high income superannuation contributions threshold for 250,000 to 200,000. This particular law is called Division 293 tax, and what it, well, how it works is, if you are earning at your personal level as an individual, 250,000, then what happens is at the moment is, for example, if you make a contributions, generally in a super fund it tax at 15%, but because you are earning more than 250,000, they charge you additional tax of 15%. So for example, a normal person makes a contribution of 10,000 in the super fund, he ends up paying $1,500. But because this particular person is earning more, more than 250,000, he ends up paying another 15%, which is 1,500. So total, he ends up paying $3,000. That person ends up paying 30% tax instead of 15% tax. Now that's a current law, which is, <coughs> which is okay. But what they are proposing is, that threshold of the income, 250,000, would reduce from 250,000 to only 200,000. So so many, pe so many people who were not in that tax or income bracket, now they will be affected as well. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Would that include any capital gains tax that you earned during that year as well? That's right, yes. Both? Yes. So, so in that particular case, what sort of income, which is covered, which is your all taxable income, then fringe benefit, then tax-free government pensions, the foreign income, which is not included in your taxable income, and any net investment losses. All of that would be covered in this Division 293 income, so which would cover most of the things. But anyway, so how it works is, Division 293 income, which is for, for example, this person has 220,000, and that person made superannuation contributions of 20,000. So total, 240,000 on a basis of that. But because at the moment, the Division 293 threshold is 250,000. So because that person is not above that threshold, there is no additional 15% tax payable on the concession contributions. But the proposed law, if the same situations are there, because the threshold has reduced to 200,000 now, that person ended up paying another $3,000 worth of contribution tax. So um, that's what the changes are happening, and those are the effects of that. So I'll put it back to Mark now. 
Yeah, that's just going back to this one here for a sec. Interesting with negative gearing as well, because if negative gearing is taken out, then I suppose the 200 will be a lot easier to get to. True. <coughs> Very true. Yeah. So there's whammies all over the place. <laughs> I suppose one other super one, which um, more to do with businesses, is that in relation to the super, <coughs> in relation to the super guarantee, at the moment that's 9.5% that you have to pay. Labor wants to ramp that up to 12% by 2021. Yeah. So what does that mean for businesses? Do you increase an employer's remuneration by an extra percent, or do you factor in the current remuneration? And so that's all inclusive of all superannuation. So from an employee's point of view, are they going to be able to afford the mortgage on their home, for example, if they've got left up less after tax pay? So just a, another another change which hasn't really had a lot of a lot of a uh, lot, lot of press. <laughs> So let's put things into perspective a little bit. For well, things to happen, Labor must win the election. They've already given you the odds already. Reading a, uh, an article last night on, on Domain, believe it or not, and they put the probability of an 85% chance of Labor winning. So it's all heading that way, or the news polls say it, or opinion polls say it, but then again, Trump got in, and he away the grand final two years ago and won it. So yeah, all these little things you don't know. <laughs> you don't really know to do. Um, Labor wants to control of the House of Reps. Um, so that's the other thing, which I suppose everybody's predicting is going to be a landslide, but it's a long way to go yet. A long way to go. Uh, Labor wants to control of the Senate. And this is the interesting one for me. One, there's 76 seats in the Senate. Only 30 are, uh, 38 are up for re-election. So for Labor to control, to cut a long story short, they have to win 25 out of 38 seats to control the Senate. And so that's a fairly tall ask, a very, very tall ask. So on the assumption that that doesn't happen, then they have to get the support of the crossbenchers. Uh, the Greens do support the CGT changes and the negative gearing, but then other crossbenchers don't support the franking credits. So you might get a situation where there's going to have to be a bit of toing and froing, and probably a lot of watering down for these measures. So it all's going to come down to the Senate in the end. So I think that's what I'll be looking for on election night, watching Channel 9 at 7, 7.30 and seeing, seeing, the, seeing the results. Um, that's a very interesting one. So I think in summary, I think that's all that we do have. So in, is there any questions? We've got plenty, we've got plenty of time. Um, questions by anybody about any topic, um, about this or any other matter that we haven't covered today? Are you going to forward this to us electronically? Yeah, you yeah, whizzed definitely. through it and yeah, mm, yeah good. definitely. Thank you. So um, you touched on franking credits, and that was more to do with when this um, when you got shares in a self-managed super fund. Yeah. What if you had shares in a trust? Shares in a trust. Um, very good question. So we'll give you an example. You got got a trust that's got losses in there already. Mm -hmm. Okay. It receives a dividend <coughs> from either a private company or through um, through the company through the ASX. Yep. Okay, so the losses are applied against the dividend. We distribute that from a trust to a beneficiary. The franking credits are a lot more than the normal 30%, aren't they, effectively? You're getting more franking credits than you are in taxable income. Or well, depending on the percentage of yeah, the franking, franking credits. Yeah, depending on the percentage. Could be 40%, could be frank, or 50%. Yeah. The net effect. Yeah, that will be lost as well. So when the franking, okay, so when the, they want to get rid of the franking credits, so you don't get the benefit of that. But at the moment, as it stands, the companies withhold the tax and they're paying the tax yep. on your investment. So they'll be paying 100%, is that right? Of the, is that how it's going to work? If the frank, if you're no longer getting any franking credits, who is the are the companies paying the yeah, tax? Yeah, the company will still pay the tax on. So the corporate right. tax will still be the same. It's a flow through to their yeah. shareholders. Yeah. So once the shareholders so receive simply, it, then the shareholders in their personal tax return, they're either going to have a tax a tax payable, use franking credits to reduce that down to hopefully zero. Yep. Any unused franking credits from that point will be lost. It doesn't matter mm. what the source is, whether it's from a trust, a private company, an ASX company. That does not matter. And just the other thing is the in terms of uh, how long you've owned the shares for or say with property as well, is do you think there's going to the Labor government will draw a line in the sand in times in terms of time? Are they just going to say from the doesn't matter if you've had the property for 10 years and you've been in, in you've, you've had the benefits of that property under the current um, laws yep. for 10 years yep. and that's how you planned your whole you know your investments and then bang from this day it's just that's it yeah well property's going to be grandfathered in terms of cgt but from the shares point of view that's a good question so but i yeah, think it's on the grandfather clause what constitutes the definition of an investment 
does it have to be rented, the property have to be rented out, for example? Yeah, again, that's got to be in the legislation, again. Yeah. So it's Lots got to be, yeah, it's a lot of questions which we don't yeah. have the answers for, because everything's going to be in the legislation in terms of criteria to meet. And yeah. that's something that we can guess, I'd love to say yes to your answer that I know, no, but um, I don't know it. I don't yeah. know it. We can always sort of say, here's what the law is, here's what yeah. it looks like. Um, once the final detail comes out, I'm sure there'll be more sessions run to actually go through the final technicalities of it. Sure, thank you. So not going to grandfather any investments? No. Share investments? In terms of grant credits? Not or yeah, from a, yeah, from a CGT point of view, the share is going to be grandfathered. Right. But, but anything <coughs> new going forward, yeah, okay. in terms of CGT, capital gains tax discount. Yeah, close to close yeah. that. Possibly, yeah. possibly. Um, yeah, franking credits, they said no grandfathering at the moment, it hasn't been mentioned, so any franking, any, re any refunds that you get from franking credits, it looks as though you won't, won't be getting it, it doesn't matter how well you're paying shares for. Right. So if you have a family home and you decide to rent it out, because you're going to have to travel around the world question. or whatever, yeah. um, that will be not deemed as a new home and as a result, you can't get it. When, when you get it. That's, yeah, that's right, when did it become an investment property? Mm -hmm. That's the question that you have to ask, okay. I would imagine. It's going to be post-commencement date. So I suppose logically speaking, I wouldn't think that would be grandfathered, but again, yeah, you have to wait for legislation. Um, I'm, I'm conscious we've got an election in May now, assuming Labor gets in. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in your views as to whether they've got any chance of implementing between May and end of June a lot of these changes. Or they the said they wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. They said everything at least will start from 1 July. Yeah, because yeah, that's when the half Senate actually but, takes power. Yeah. Yeah. But do they actually have the ability to, to, to organise that by the 1st of July? And how long do they think it's going to take? I mean, I can see well, it going to 20 well, directly. Well, it depends with legislation and then, I mean, it goes to the House of Reps, so they debate it, it goes to the Senate, back to the House of Reps, back to the Senate. It can take quite a long time. And when you look at the super changes for the $1.6 million pension, uh, the commencement date of that was the 9th of November, 17. But it was announced way before that in the budget in May, yeah. in May 17. So it took the whole six months to go through. So whether they can backdate it, when they said <laughs> one of these changes that I went through, um, the CGT one, 1 July 19. So they may be able to backdate it to that date, but not any time before that. And they said that. Okay. Any further questions? Think back to the grandfathering. Um, back in the very old days, if you had property pre 1980, presumably that would stay as is in terms of the grandfathering provisions. So the pre-85 properties from the CGC, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all pre yeah, that's all in legislation. So they're not changing that. Okay. So that will still be tax rate. Okay. So it's no further questions. Um I hope you got um, something out of it today. It's more like I said, it's an awareness campaign at the moment to sort of make sure that you understand fully what the labour changes are. Uh, whether it influences your vote or not, um, well, who knows? You know, like, tax is only one reason why I vote to influence, I suppose, but it's more to be aware of what it affects your circumstances, and if it does, so feel free to speak to your um, advisor or your person, the chair. So, thank you. Thank you very much.